Hello, everyone, and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Mestier, and today we're having a look at yet another fascinating piece of chemical detection equipment. This is a General Electric H7 halogen leak detector, and this was developed sometime during the late 1950s, early 1960s, to detect leaks in refrigeration equipment, specifically equipment running on halogen-based refrigerants such as R12, R22, R134, and sulfur hexafluoride. Now, this particular unit has definitely seen better days, but all of the vital components are present and accounted for, so I can still show you how this works. So let's dive right in. So this comes in a leather carrying case with a shoulder strap. As you can see, this one is missing its top flap, and a lot of it is coming apart. Uh, on the front, we have a number of controls, including our on-off switch. We have an outer sensitivity knob and an inner balancing knob. And then finally, something called a reference leak, which we'll get to in a second. On one end, we have a grill for the speaker that gives the detection output. And then on the bottom, a bunch of other grills to allow airflow to cool the electronics. Now, if we look inside, we have a very long power cord, which is very important because the piece of equipment that you're trying to detect a leak in might be a considerable distance from the nearest power outlet. Now, these were made in versions for both 110 and 240 volt power supplies, and these were distinguished not only by the shape of the plug, but also the color of the leather carrying case. Gray, as in this example, for 110 volts, and brown for 240 volts. And then we have our sampling probe, which uses an onboard pump to collect air and pass it through this flexible tube over the detection element. Right, so to set this up for use, you plug it in, you flip your main power switch, and you'll immediately hear the pump start up. And then after a couple of seconds, the tube in the amplifier will warm up, and you will hear the high-pitched whine of the detection signal. Right. So turn that off for now. The next step would be to check the airflow through the probe. Now, this particular probe is actually missing a key component, which is a little airflow ball. And what you're supposed to do is hold the probe vertically like this and ensure that that ball is floating freely inside this transparent cone. And if it isn't, this indicates either there's a problem with the pump or there's some sort of obstruction in the system. And this could be as simple as this little filter element inside the probe, which prevents dust and other contaminants from getting into the detection element, is clogged. And these came shipped with a repair kit containing a number of basic tools, as well as replacement parts, including filters. Right, so the next step is to balance and calibrate the circuit. And so with this turned on, you turn the balance knob until the signal just stops. And then you take your probe and put it up against the reference leak. Now this is simply a little aluminum bottle filled with half an ounce or 14 grams of R11 refrigerant. And it has a calibrated orifice that allows the refrigerant to leak out at a rate of 14 grams or a whole bottle every year. Now when these shipped out from General Electric, that orifice was covered over with a disposable cap, which once you received the unit, you were supposed to remove and discard. And this meant that you had to refill this bottle every year or so. Now. With the probe held up against the orifice, you would then tune your sensitivity knob until you just hear the signal. And for reasons we'll go over in just a minute, the sensitivity of the detection element goes down over the lifetime of the unit, meaning that you continuously have to increase the sensitivity of the amplifier. Right, so let's have a closer look at the internals and let me show you how this works. So. To remove the chassis, we simply undo this big screw on the front panel, and the chassis just pops out like that. Right, so right away we can see some of our major components. We have, of course, our reference leak bottle. We have a transformer for converting mains power into the various voltages needed to run the other internal components. We have our output speaker, and then we have our air pump, which interestingly enough is a little bellows style pump operated by an oscillating electromechanical relay. And this draws air from the probe and passes it over our detection element, which is inside this part of the chassis. And so to get at that, we first have to remove this grill. We then use an Allen key to remove the set screw retaining the balance knob, then remove both knobs. undo this little threaded collar. Then we undo this little screw here. 
and then two circuit boards will pop out. And the one that we're interested in here is this one, which has both our amplifier and our actual detection element. So this is what's known as a halogen diode. And the earliest patent I could find for this was granted in 1951 to one Chester Rice, who was working for the General Electric Company. And his design consisted of two concentric platinum cylinders across which an electric potential of around 300 volts is applied. The anode cylinder is heated to around 1000 degrees Celsius by a platinum or nichrome resistance wired heater. Now, as stated in his patent, Rice's original design was intended to detect a wide variety of different substances, with the detection action being based on the work function or ionization potential of the substance being detected. That is how much energy it takes to strip away an electron and turn that atom or molecule into a positively charged cation. So if a substance has a lower work function than platinum, then it will be ionized by the heated anode and being positively charged will be drawn towards the cathode. This creates an ion current that can be detected and amplified by the appropriate circuitry. In his patent, Rice gives the example that light wood or cigarette smoke, which contains alkali metals like sodium and potassium, are easily detected since alkali metals have work functions lower than platinum, while heavier carbon-bearing smoke cannot be detected because carbon has a higher work function. For detecting halogens, however, the design must be slightly altered by introducing an internal source of sensitizing alkali metal ions. In his patent, Rice suggests a cylinder of aluminum oxide, or alumina, which typically contains alkali metal impurities. Though commercial versions use ceramic elements soaked in solutions of various alkali metals, including lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. This particular detector uses a mixture of iron and potassium hydroxide. And how this works is that when the element is powered up, potassium atoms in the sensitizing source are ionized and migrate towards the cathode, eventually coating the surface in a thin layer of potassium. This impedes further ions from migrating, causing the ion current to taper off to a low level. Now, if a gas containing halogens is introduced, this ion current will increase. This is because the halogens, being highly reactive with alkali metals, will strip the potassium off the cathode, allowing more potassium ions to be released and migrate over. And when the halogen source is removed, the potassium layer reforms on the cathode and the ion current drops down to previous levels. Now, there are two important things worth pointing out here. Number one, this type of sensor is not appropriate for use in flammable atmospheres because introducing a flammable gas to a detection element heated to 1000 degrees Celsius is the perfect way to have yourself a very bad day. Though there are versions using sensitizers such as sodium hydroxide that operate at much lower temperatures and are appropriate for use in flammable atmospheres. And second, as I mentioned before, the sensitivity of this detector will decrease over time. And this is because the alkali metal atoms in the sensitizing source become depleted over time. This means that you need to increase the sensitivity of the amplifier over the lifetime of the detector and eventually replace the detection element itself. So for the sake of completeness, let's talk a little bit about that amplifier. This is based around a General Electric Canada or GEC 6M11 Compactron twin triode pentode, which as you can see from this diagram has two separate triode elements with one grid between the emitter and the collector and one pentode with three grids. Now in this particular circuit, the triodes are wired up as a two-stage amplifier to amplify the very weak signal coming from the detection element, while the pentode is wired up as an audio oscillator, which produces that detection tone that you hear coming from the speaker. Now, to ensure that the sensitivity of the amplifier can be adjusted as the sensitivity of the detection element decreases, this is wired up as a Wheatstone bridge with two variable resistors, one attached to the balancing knob, one attached to the sensitivity knob. And the balancing knob sets the Wheatstone bridge to zero, it balances it, while the sensitivity knob sets the threshold signal strength set by the reference leak that will unbalance the bridge and allow current to flow to the signal generator system. Now the H7 was just one in a long line of GE halogen detectors which included the H6 and the H10. Now unfortunately, just like with Hewlett Packard in my previous video on oscilloscope cameras, I wasn't able to find very many catalogs or other information on GE's historic product line. And so I really can't tell you exactly when these units were introduced or what other units there might have been in the series. Though if any of you are more knowledgeable on the subject, please let me know. 
However, I was able to dig up a little bit of information on the H10, which was introduced in the mid-1970s and was one of the most popular halogen detectors of its type, being rebadged or manufactured under license by several companies including Johnson Controls, Mars, Yokogawa, and Bacharach. Now, the H10 introduced a number of design improvements over earlier models, most notably a unitized standalone detection element. Now, the detection element in the H7 is well integrated into the circuit board and difficult for the average user to replace, while the element on the H10 can be swapped out as easily as a burnt-out vacuum tube. The H10 also had a simpler slider for setting the detector sensitivity range, an indicator lamp for the detector, and a sight glass to show the level of refrigerant left in the reference leak bottle. Now today, detectors like this are obsolete in many applications because most halogen-based refrigerants have been banned and phased out under the 1987 Montreal Protocol due to their ozone-depleting properties. However, there are many older refrigeration systems still in use, as well as many industrial processes that use halogens of various kinds, and so there is still a market for halogen detectors, though most new units will use infrared spectrometry, which is far more sensitive and versatile. Anyway, that is a brief overview of the H7 halogen detector. I hope you found that interesting. And again, if you have any more information on this whole product line, please let me know. Anyway, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time in another video or look at yet more detection equipment and other fascinating devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.